welcome back to the Rachel and Mr. Dutcom, the Rider Chicken Show. Trade your trading plans, don't take too much risk on anyone, trade, and just let yourself get rich. Hello everyone, welcome back to the rationalinvestor.com's uh, weekly free YouTube show, The Broiler Chicken Show. Da -da 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 -da. I'm not quite sure um, what the video quality of this show is going to be like here today. I mean, Chris is really working his butt off, so as always, but it might be a bit splotchy. Uh, we've got kind of a jury rig set up here. And I'm actually going to take a, a week or two off here now and actually officially go on vacation. So, uh, yes, we are down in El Salvador and actually feeling very, very tired today. I think I might even just let the gang all go do their thing and I might just take the day off myself. But um, anyway, I thought I'd, uh, out of courtesy at the very least, give you a, uh, a small report here today. Uh, and uh, just give you an idea of what it is we're seeing. And if we're lucky, maybe the rest of the TRI team can just pick up the ball and uh, carry on. If anything, maybe I'll just stand back and watch and see whether this place is ready to actually spread its wings and be the non-Brian Beamish show, <laughs> as it seems to be for the past 10 years. Maybe this uh, site can actually start supporting itself. That would be great to see. But uh, anyway, we'll see. So a uh, limited report that I'll give you today, I guess some of the sort of bigger picture things that I'm seeing. It's interesting to see. I'm not quite sure how the algorithm and whether these are actually reporting correctly or not. I guess we're still in sort of building out phase, but uh, it is interesting to see the data that we have here. A lot of bearer sentiment. Uh, on the bullish percentage, uh, where basically the flat, fast signals are all below the slow signals. Well, not all, but a good chunk of them. A little scary how uh, crypto here is actually uh, flashing uh, egregiously overbought signals. Uh, I did uh, post that on, um, on Twitter uh, through the week. And, you know, in pretty typical fashion, actually, I should probably refrain from usually, you know, like old professor dude sits there and just sort of like rubs his beard while he talks. But I actually don't think I look too good. I saw myself on camera doing it a second ago. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, one thing I did when I built my 1980s website, I found that this was incredibly accurate that when you uh, saw both the slow or, uh, well, I guess the fast moving average, the short term moving average, all of the markets, and you can see fast here sitting at 96.67 for the crypto top 30. The only problem with this is that the crypto top 30 doesn't even have 30 names in it. So like I said, unfortunately, we're still building this thing out, uh, trying to make it uh, professional grade quality. I just don't know whether we're there yet or not. But having said that, the data that we are producing right now, uh, I do see that it is uh, spitting out heavily, heavily overbought uh, reading there on the short term and heavily overbought reading on the medium term, which generally speaking is a dangerous situation. Think of it as kind of like the rubber band. You can only stretch the rubber band one direction so far. Uh, and then once you sort of stretch that rubber band out, to its extreme, there's really only one direction it can go. So did put out warnings, sort of, uh, you know, sort of flashing the warning. And, you know, the sad part about this, this is the kind of market where uh, names are going to be going a little bit crazy here. And hopefully what you've done is uh, you bought when you were supposed to buy. In fact, I even put out a tweet uh, recently, can you buy when you're supposed to buy? When, ironically enough, the public is not really that interested uh, in buying. And then in these kind of environments, for God's sakes, don't spend your money. If anything, what you should be doing is having all your doubles orders all working. And as the market's rallying into your levels, uh, you're banging out doubles and all that kind of fun stuff. 
Um, I suppose if there are names that are at the bottom end of their ranges and they are putting in W's and momentum's coming in and volume's coming in, and it's technically a setup, I suppose you could go in and pull the trigger on those kind of names, but uh, try not to chase. Try, try, try not to chase. And unfortunately, you know, as I said, uh, the public just doesn't understand this. And, uh, you know, as, you know, on sort of a side note, uh, I went to a... I, geez, I'm not even quite sure what you call it. I guess it was like a local uh, Bitcoin enthusiast kind of meetup. Um, I was sort of quasi sponsored by this local government, um, some sort of government body agency. Non profit. Non profit. Is, is that what they were? And I have to say, I wasn't overly impressed. Um, and uh, sadly, when I actually asked the people who are supposed to be, quote unquote, the authorities on uh, how blockchain actually works and how do you actually get value out of the Bitcoin, like why does it have any value at all? It's total blank faces. So, I mean, I don't know whether the local government has uh, any interest whatsoever in actually teaching the people how this stuff actually works in reality uh, and why it's valuable. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a little bit, um, to be honest with you, I'm a little bit, um, I don't know, would you say disappointed? I don't know whether disappointed, that might be too, too strong of a word, but I wasn't, oh, I wasn't overly impressed with what I saw. And what worries me is that you have a whole bunch of people sitting around a table going, you know, and of course, this audience, you guys were all extremely intelligent. Um, and uh, I actually think I discount the level of intelligence of our community and the people who watch our stream on a regular basis. Uh, we're not normal people. <laughs> Just, just first smile I put on my face <laughs> today. Uh, unfortunately, the normal people, I can start to feel them. They're starting to get all crypto circle jerky. Uh, they don't really understand value. They certainly don't understand basic technical analysis. Uh, you can feel the trap. The trap's being set. So be careful, everybody. And for good heaven's sakes, you know, if, if you have winning positions, um, pay yourself. There's no reason why you can't take some profits. Establish those risk-free positions, of course, you know, because of the tax man. You can maybe spend a little bit or, you know, um, sell a little bit more to make sure that you pay your taxes. But uh, I think as professionals here, unfortunately, we have to almost think of the equation as very, well, not very, but slightly different than the way the public uh, the public is acting right now. So public's pretty excited. Uh, and of course, you know, prices are zooming up. So it's understandable why they would be. But we as professionals have to uh, ask ourselves, well, is this appropriate places for us to be spending our money? Or maybe we should maybe just let things cool down a little bit before we go dumping more capital into the market. So uh, I suppose when we look at the price charts, it'll be pretty self-evident what I'm talking about there. Did notice, you know, this past week as uh, Chris and I were making our way down the West Coast, didn't really spend too much time looking at the econs in particular. But if we just sort of look at the overview, you know, something that jumped out at me that actually surprised me, we didn't pick up on it. Maybe it was because I wasn't on uh, the call on Thursday, but retail sales in the United States came in dramatically lower than expectations. That was uh, quite shocking. Um so you can see that the consumer is is getting pinched here. Um, and then I have talked to you guys about this before, and this is sort of macro, not really crypto specific related. Um, but, uh, you know, the headlines here, um, you know, oil climbs to an 11 week high. And the worst part about this is when are we supposed to buy our unleaded gasoline? Are we supposed to be selling our unleaded gasoline call options and futures contracts now? Or are we supposed to be buying, loading up on them now, expecting higher prices over the months ahead? 
I think you all know the answer to that. So, um, um, the, we have a situation where the consumer is not happy at all. Uh, inflation is starting to tick back up. You can start to see sort of the, there, there are rumblings in the economy underneath that, that things might start to be buckling a little bit here, especially with things like uh, the housing market. Um, and this week ahead, you notice that stocks themselves, they uh, said that they sort of ended them the, the past week soft. Uh, we have FOMC minutes coming up and anybody who plays the market on a relatively regular basis, uh, you know that the uh, the market usually does not like to, uh, it doesn't receive these Fed minutes very well. And if you think about it, I do believe that the market was just conned by these central bankers, which is really tragic. You don't really even like to say those kind of things. Um, I have been talking to you guys about this for a while, so it's certainly not anything new. You know, just uh, well, actually, probably the easiest way to show you is uh, is uh, these bond charts that we've been talking about recently. Um, I believe that there was a huge uh, sort of debt refinancing that had to be done uh, over the first quarter of uh, 2024. In fact, uh, that RJ talks, Chris seems to like watching him lately. Uh, I pointed it out and he's been pointing him out uh, recently, but uh, that RJ talks uh, kind of was going on and on about how the massive debt issuance that needed to get refinanced here. And mysteriously, the bond market just lifted here. And, and the anticipation was the economy's rolled over. The Fed's telling us they're getting ready to lower interest rates. what you're supposed to be thinking if you see the market smiling at us. Uh, and of course, you know, the fact that we've got uh, energy prices starting to rise again, which is a leading inflationary component. And then what's fascinating is uh, in this go round, we actually might find that the economy itself is actually going to be slowing down because interest rates are starting to move back up again. Right? You could even argue that the peak in rates was there at the end of December. Uh, and they have been begrudgingly slowly climbing back up here now. And in a weird sort of way, you know, the stock market, I've been scratching my head here going, why is the stock market moving up? Why is the stock market moving up? You know, just on this short term base, you can see the end of December there was basically the peak in the short term. This is the U.S. two year paper, which kind of follows that Fed uh, paper closely. Um the Russell 2000 actually hasn't been doing anything. Uh, you might even argue, um, you know, if we again use that same end of December kind of narrative, there's the end of December right there. You know, gee whiz. You know, we know that, of course, uh, the interest rate market, uh, the bond market is smiling at us already. Is it a potential that uh, the stock market goes and smiles at us? Somebody was asking recently on social media if I would consider this a valid smile with it sitting right here. This is not a valid smile yet, right? If we trade down through these lows, uh, then the smile is validated. So right now, it's a potential. It's floating out there. Uh, and considering the way the interest rate market is acting, uh, it doesn't surprise me that the broad market just really have not participated uh, in this stock market. What's up, Chris? Um, so there's a leave grief uh, bandwidth issue, but we, we're, we're powering through. Okay. Uh, my apologies, of course, we are reporting from third world interneting. So <laughs> take it for whatever it's worth. As somebody was bitching and complaining recently, uh, yeah, just try and remember how much you have to pay for this broadcast. <laughs> so you get what you pay for. Uh, third world interneting. When's that Chris going to get his Starlink set up? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Super excited for that. Anyway, so, you know, we just have to understand that there are rumblings. There are problems 
that are developing in the broader market. Uh, and interestingly enough, I mean, it's been a bit of a slog recently with the dashboard, but you can kind of see, you know, the the short term momentum in the stock market is not really impressive. In fact, it's actually quite um, disconnected. Something's just not right here with this market, right? The short term picture, what you saw out of that Russell 2000 is actually deteriorating. So what's interesting about this whole image right here is that crypto is sort of, uh, it's sort of out on an island right now, which is fascinating. I think that actually the crypto universe does look almost exactly like that S&P. Like there's just something fundamentally wrong with this image right now. Um, uh, it is interesting to see that crypto top 30. Remember when we looked at the uh, overbought, oversold on the medium and short term? I mean, uh, the, just this crypto top 30, the, the sexy hot list here, uh, everything is in rally mode. That can only go so so long. And then this, and what concerning, you know, I don't really mind so much when you see the breadth of the market sort of in this mid zone. It does mean it's disconnected. And there's, a, you know, this is massive divergence. There's a problem here with the internal strength or let's say the internal health of the market, but it's not like, oh my God, we're setting up for some sort of you know crash because we're just sort of sitting midpoint. What's concerning is this selective list of top 30, but I don't think it's top 30. Like if we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, uh, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 24 names, you know, so I'm not quite sure what the logic is behind our uh, algorithm here, but uh, ideally I'd like to see that as the top 30. But anyway, uh, never been closer. Dev team's working away. It's hopefully, fingers crossed, they can cross that bridge at some point down the road here. But anyway, the point here is just of this uh, selective list, Everything is moving up. Everything is up at the top. Everything in the short term is up. Everything in the medium term is up. And that, like I started off the broadcast with today here, that rubber band can only be struck so far. And at some point, you know, we have to start getting some equilibrium back in the market. So anyway, uh, there is trouble, trouble brewing. And then, of course, you know, if we bring this all back full circle, you know, again, sort of just finishing off this... Uh, this uh, higher time frame conversation, sort of macro look. Um, I don't know what did our January barometer? And actually, you know, I got to say, uh, Josh is. Um, this is probably not the page I want to look at. Uh, Josh is a January barometer blog post, uh, which is completely free. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe Chris can include a link into that. Uh, on the uh, on the description, uh, but if I go uh, SPY, and we just look at what January did, and usually that's a pretty good harbinger for what is going to come for the year. Um, where are we here? There's December way over there. So January, um, yeah, it's roughly somewhere there. To somewhere there. Uh, uh. So you can see that the first sort of half of this year is kind of like bob and weave, bob and weave. And then the second half of the year was rally, rally. So do you find it a bit interesting? I mean, I, don't, I guess, uh, well, yeah, I guess it is right there. Um, this January period, January, February, if you will, that's supposed to be this. It's interesting how at the beginning of the, uh, the report, um, market basically sold off. I would have expected actually us to be a bit weak. And then, you know, as we kind of pointed out with the Russell 2000, the Russell 2000 is actually still below these levels. It has not gone up like this, right? If we go, um, uh, what is that? I think it's uh, IWM. Is that the Russell 2000? Yeah, there we go. Hey, not as senile as I thought it was. So there is the end of 2003 there. 
this has just been a wash. It's basically nothing's happened. So, I mean, does that mean that the small cap market is actually going to be underwater for a good portion of uh, 2024? Could be, you know. It really wouldn't be shocking. But I guess just with regard to uh, the S&P 500, and then, um, you know, in Josh's report, uh, we also had a uh, comment. He put a comment in about uh, Larry Williams' uh, sort of prognostications of years uh, that are election years. Usually the first half of the year is kind of poopy. And then the second half of the year, when we have a better idea of who's going to sort of be driving the bus, uh, that usually outperforms. So, um I'm actually a little surprised, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I'm actually surprised that the market is as strong as it is. Having said that, and you know, this is the same thing we said about the uh, the market uh, from that other perspective. You know, let's keep an eye on whether we start to smile. If we do, and uh, we start trading below here, get ready. There could be a pretty substantial pullback. It's not here now. It's not here yet. But you know, probably good traders. You should, at the very least, just respect that, you know, we are up against the top end of the range here. We're starting to show some signs of weakness. Do we actually start to see things like, uh, um, you know, bear divs, like if we pull up the daily chart? No real sign of break here yet, but do we actually start to get those bear divs that are sort of our in initial warning sign that there's problems. You see that Willie is stupidly and egregiously stupidly, <laughs> egregiously stupidly, there's a term for you, uh, overbought. You can see RSI is actually making lower highs as we speak. My MACD histogram, my favorite uh, momentum oscillator uh, is just not happy here at all. In fact, it has confirmed a bearish divergence on the daily chart. So let's see if any of you on YouTube are listening. Uh, cool, your what? <laughs> when you see a confirmed uh, bearish momentum divergence, uh, what are you supposed to be doing here? Is this really a good idea? Is this, you know, just on balance, is it a good idea to go buy stocks right up here? I mean, come on. Thank you, Vallis. Nice answer. Uh, Adam C says, sounds great so far. All right. Not quite sure what that means. Thank you, Constantine. Excellent. Thank you, Adam. Actually, Adam's here. Um, Adam's here in... Uh, what the hell is this place? El Salvador. <laughs> He's here with us. I think he just uh, he just turned up yesterday. So anyway, check Zoom. check Zoom. All right. What's Zoom? Zoom. Where's Zoom? Zoom's over here. Seward has informed me that you get to the crypto top 30 from a different location than what you referenced. You click on market universe from the left hand side of the site dashboard and look at crypto top 30. Oh, I see. Uh, Sior just sent you that message? Yeah. Uh, so maybe PM him back. Is there any way we can have the two lists the same, please? <laughs> Seems a bit, uh, I wonder why they wouldn't be the same, but all right. So the Crypto Top 30 actually does have 30 names in it. Uh, so that's encouraging. All right, Adam says, the quality of the broadcast sounds great. Oh, thanks, Adam. Adam's uh, always a uh, ever-present cheerleader for TRI, so appreciate that. And thank you, Seward, for the clarification. Everybody on the interneting should be uh, made aware that the Crypto Top 30 is 30 names, so not this list. So I wonder why we have Crypto Top 30 written here. Maybe that's something completely different. Anyway. Eh, you know, it's just, the, hey, this is a work in progress. Uh, we are, you know, never been closer. Uh, we have been working away on this. I do, you know, really like using this, um, this uh, platform to get a pretty good idea of who the leaders in the market are right now, um, who the laggers are, maybe the ones you probably want to maybe avoid for now. Uh, also, too, this gives you a pretty good idea of sort of the, the broader market as well. Uh, with the universe, who are the leaders in the, uh, the, the broader universe. And also, too, uh, just anybody who is a subscriber to this, remember that Seward did uh, go and make a huge change recently 
in that we stopped using Binance and Trex and uh, I think it was Kraken for our sort of crypto uh, resources. And we we do it primarily off of, uh, I think it's CoinMarketCap, the Binance owned uh, platform now. Uh, the team decided to make that transition as it would be a bit smoother for us to uh, track the crypto top 30. So just FYI there, if you see any sort of discrepancies with the data, you're kind of like, what happened recently? Just know that uh, CR did a, a big change uh, on the site. So. Um, okay, so finishing off that thought that I had earlier, um, I'm just concerned you know, keep in mind, you listen to the public. Of course, public's all circle jerky bullish. Right? You know, we've had a huge move up. And of course, when we get to crypto, we'll see that in, in glorious technicolor. But now off of the daily charts, uh, we are now starting to see. Um, we're starting to see confirmed divergences uh, on things like MACD histograms, which is a major, major warning sign. Doesn't necessarily mean it's a sell signal outright, but this would be like our L Tango Nader setup. In fact, I think I even saw somebody posting that earlier today, where we would just simply uh, take the most recent range. Remember that that October low, all that sort of bullshit about the bond market manipulation. Uh, back up to our recent high here. Uh, and uh, there would be the technical objective. Interesting how the 200 SMA is sitting right there. And also, too, you see this big old hole on the charts here. So what they're probably going to do at some point, remember we saw this in 2019, same 2020, same damn thing. They'll probably dump the market into these lows. You know, you can, uh, all of you longtime uh, listeners, followers know, of course, how this works. What's the percentage? That should be an interesting little trivia question for you guys. What's the percentage uh, probability? I guess I don't know whether that makes sense or not, that these holes will all be filled in, these gaps. You all know the answer to that. Uh, I would say that you use the 50% level as sort of your just keep it simple <laughs> technical objective, but quite often you know, we get actual reload zone pullbacks. What do you think the odds are that that's 61.8 and that's 78.6? <laughs> I bet pretty good. Let's see. Survey says, well, oh, went the wrong way. Uh, let's try that again. Um, is that it? That used to be a gear icon. It actually now looks like a, uh, a bolt. Anyway. Oh, look at that. Pretty close. Oh, 88.6 is where the gap is. So, you know, Brian's favorite fib. You can kind of see this stuff all sort of setting itself up here. We got the, I mean, look at the size of this bear div. Wow, that's what she said. Look at the RSI div, right? And we often talk about like second and third uh, M's in price. I think you can make the argument that you got like this big honking M. You got another M over here. So, you know, if these, if this, you know, you got this big M and then you got this smaller M. I mean, if we start closing down through here, maybe this is a smaller one. This will be the first one. And then this second bigger one will be the second one. And if that's through the 50 line, then you all know how significant that is. Fucking run for the hills. Eh? So there's lots and lots of anecdotal evidence that there is technical trouble brewing. The only problem is, like I said earlier, 99% of the public, they haven't got a clue what it is when we start talking about things like markets overbought, markets oversold, it's in divergence, it's trade location. Ironically enough, if you can actually understand what I'm saying here on this video, you're like, you're, you are more educated than, like I said, 80, 90% of all market participants anywhere. I mean, you go to Wall Street, the irony of it all is half of them, they're just, they're all barking the shill that they're told by their bosses to bark. They don't really know themselves, especially not sort of personal experience. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what an overbought, overextended market looks like. So, so, you know, there's your stock market image. I, I don't know whether we actually have trade location per se. I mean, we might do things like... Uh, 
uh, chaos theory to see whether we run into any sort of upside resistance here. Let's see what we got. 2.618, where are you? Huh? yeah, see, so 2.618. We could still work our way a bit higher here. That's the sort of scary part about all of this. Um, yeah, I don't really have any A, B, C, Ds. I suppose maybe there's one here. We could go from that low up to that high. And then uh, we'll go set up. And you up to here. And so that means A, B, C, D. We've actually gone beyond that level. I'd be curious to see whether we've hit like 127s or 1.618. I don't think we've hit 1.618, but we might have hit um, 127. Oh, not quite. So actually, we could still work our way a little bit higher here. But at the same time, too, with all this anecdotal evidence, you all should be looking at this going, I can't buy that. Uh, you just come way too late to the party. So interestingly enough, now we could go two different directions here. We could just branch straight off into crypto stocks and review some of them, you know, given the crypto nature of this uh this broadcast and the community. Obviously, crypto is probably where we want to go next. Or we could actually look at the crypto names themselves. So I don't know. Give me some feedback here, people. Would you like me to uh take a look at the crypto stocks here in our time that we have here? Um, I guess we got about an hour left. Uh, look at some of the crypto names in the stock market, or do we just want to just jump right into crypto names themselves? Do we have anybody actually in the call with us here today? Glasses. Uh, Glass Insights, who we still don't know who that is. Uh, what do we say here? Very GAN objective. Okay, that's an interesting comment. Yes, stocks, please. Crypto names, crypto stocks. Well, we got two votes for stocks and one vote for crypto names. I'm not quite sure what that is. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I was looking uh, earlier today. I mean, interesting uh, looking at the broader picture. It's, you know, I got to say, um, Seward has been uh, feeling bullish of China of late. I don't know whether I share the bullish enthusiasm, but it is interesting to see that they're trying to resolve this thing. They're trying to put in some sort of W here. I'm from Missouri, as they say, so I don't know whether I necessarily believe this, but what I think is a, is a good investment. But I do think that this thing has uh, probably been sold off maybe a little too hard. And if we think things like chaos theory... You notice that 2.618 off of this uh, W bottom is probably going to take us back up into that 200 SMA there. This is off the China large cap ETF. Uh, and also, too, you know, gaps like to be filled. You can see how all these gaps and, you know, also, uh, I think you can make the argument horizontal support and resistance. That's probably a pretty important level that they want to work the market back up to. And then anybody who wanted to sell this original market structure top, that level there, and then, of course, this level here. So right into that window, and notice 2.618 just is, uh, is just nicely snug right in that window. And my hunch is by the time they work this thing down, uh, 200 SMA will be lining up with that as well. 50% um, of this entire sell-off range is all the way up here, which would be against these highs. And of course, lots of gaps to be filled in. So hats off to Seward. Uh, he recently, he was kind of rah-rah uh, China. I don't know whether I would be rah-rah China, but eh, trade is a trade. It's moving up. It's not my cup of tea, but uh, hey, if you can make money off the ideas, rock and roll. Um, and then... Um, where am I going with all this? I don't know how relevant that is, but I've been watching. I do like the idea that on the weekly basis, if we just draw a really simple trend line off of that sort of range, you know, we said 50% levels, 200 SMAs, all that kind of stuff. You can see that there's open air uh, in this uh, market where they could work this thing back up to the trend line. No problem here. I think that's what's going on right now in China. So... 
I don't know whether that's uh that's uh relevant to crypto. Well, you know, over the years we have seen that crypto uh has done better as uh China has done better and uh, it looks to me like they're sort of uh, they're they're not in like meltdown mode. So that might be another reason why crypto is doing a little bit better here. You know, like uh, Justin Sun and Tron and all that. Saw him in the news. I can't remember what it was that I was looking at, but they made reference to him. But I think he's like a good China proxy. I think CZ's getting all ready to do shit and with that uh, Binance. Uh, the BNB, I think he said he had like 99% of his wealth in the BNB. So uh, I understand he's going to be using that as currency to finance deals. So, you know, maybe things uh, in China are looking a little bit brighter. I don't know. Tough to say. Uh, we look at China Da. China Da, of course, should do better if we see uh, the energy market do better. It's interesting how China, China Da did break to a new low here recently. Um, I don't know whether you can actually even use this as a, a study uh, for things like fog and bombs. I might even go the other direction now. Uh, boom, something like this. So if China to can uh, reverse this uh, action, you know, China to should actually move with the oil price. So if oil prices are moving up in earnest, we're probably going to see China to rally back up against these highs here. So anyway, not really something I'd be overly excited about, but man, you know what I've actually told a lot of people is, uh, re, you know, and especially when talking about Bitcoin and stuff is this is a weekly price chart. A lot of times you can make this analysis really, really simple just by simply following uh, things like uh, longer term slow moving averages. So here, for example, I've got the uh, 200 30 and 13 EMAs. So 200, that's sort of like your four-year business cycle off of the weekly charts. Uh, 13 is like your fast-moving average. 30 is your slow-moving average. And you can see how they're pointed up still here. So yeah, that's still pointing up. I don't know whether China itself uh, is pointing up on that weekly chart. I don't think it is, but yeah, we can take a quick look. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, so China's still trending down. There's there's no change there at all yet. Um, so uh, coming back to the stock market, and I guess where's the best place to do this? I wonder. I thought I had it over here. Maybe not. No, maybe it's over here. All right, uh, looking at some of the crypto stocks. And actually, I think the reason why I did a new chart is because these things are just too messy. So well, why don't we just start from scratch? Keep it as simple as possible. So uh, stock list, then we'll scroll down to our crypto names. Obviously, uh, coins are the biggest, baddest crypto stock out there. Uh, it's probably not a bad place to start. So there it is, doink. Uh, <clears throat> what do we make out of something like this? So there's your weekly chart. Uh, it might be interesting to see whether we hit a fog and bomb on the downside here. I don't know whether we want to do this as, uh, maybe we'll go logarithmic and then we will change this to logarithmic. So 2.618 was into this level. Pretty wild there. We never did get down to 4669. It is, to me, does look like a very well-defined inverted head and shoulders. So if that's the case and just sort of eyeballing this, I think it almost looks like the neckline somewhere in that neighborhood there. Well, I suppose maybe you could even say it was up against those highs. Is that, can you have an inverted head and shoulders within an inverted head and shoulders? That's a good question. If we go off of just these simple levels, then there to there, and then clone that. There's your price objective up top. Just keep it simple, stupid, which is interesting. It's basically, it's just basically going to bring the market right back to these old highs. Uh, 
You'll probably do a very simple trend line. I would say that this, and this is unfortunately where the public's going to get sucked in here. So what probably happens is this thing pops up. And of course, everybody's all circle jerk bullish. Hey, it's the next best thing since sliced bread. The only problem is that this thing's not really a buy until it actually double U's out on the other side of this trend line, something along those lines. So this is going to be really, really messy uh, over the next little bit. We are right now running into uh, this downtrend line now. So that should act as a bit of resistance. I wouldn't even be surprised if we have to play around with this trend line for a little bit. Uh, let's see. Anything else we can glean from this? We could also do fog and bombs. Yep. So <laughs> there you go. I, my hunch is we rally into foggies here, and that's what actually causes whatever sort of stall out that should happen here. We could probably also do something along the lines of A to B, and then clone that, and C to D. So again, that will take us up into, yeah, right up into this these highs. And really, you know, actually, we could probably even just do a really simple trend line, like boom, boom. And there is your major resistance line. This is a really handy tool. So if you're watching this and you're kind of like, hey, you know, I wanted to learn something new here today. And I apologize. You might see Chris in the background. I just want to try and get a little more comfortable. But uh, this is what's called a low swing low to swing high trend line. So it's this swing low. And it's this swing high. And this, I think, is actually your, this is probably a more powerful trend line than all the others put together, which is so ironic. Now, of course, the public never does a low to high trend lines. But I think that, and if anything, lining up with that 2.618 and then lining up into this uh, AB equals CD, I would be willing to bet dollars to donuts we're going to come up into this area. And also, too, you know, you guys have heard me say this at length over the years, you know, especially like these guys right in here. They probably are all a bunch of trap built bulls that would just love to get out of this trade that they got into here. And they've just been waiting, waiting, waiting. Oh, my God. Oh, it's going down. Oh, Jesus. We got to wait, wait, wait just to get released here. So I think you can make quite a bit of an argument for a coin to top out somewhere around looks like about. Let's call it somewhere between 250 and 300 bucks a share. So sitting right now, where the hell are we right now? Sitting at uh, 180, Jesus, it could still be another $100 to go here, no problem. And uh, that was kind of the comment that I made about Bitcoin here uh, when I did the, uh, the public tweet. Just feels to me, like the path of least resistance. And, you know, if we use that same logic uh, about moving averages, right, we'll throw on all our studies here. Do all our moving average fun stuff. <clears throat> moving average, there we go. Um, you, this is a really, really handy tool. It's so simple that actually a lot of people discount it because it is so darn simple. But I would just simply uh, simply say, uh, I would just say that, uh, where the hell is the damn little, I guess you can't, isn't there like an eyeball thing where you can hide this maybe? Uh, hide, there we go. So you, I think you can make the argument that there was your sell signal on coin. This is a weekly price chart. There was your buy signal on coin and you should be long since uh, March of 2023. Jesus, that's about a year, right? In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this thing actually issues a sell signal exactly one year from the buy signal. That, that would be, now somebody said, oh, that's very WD Gannish. Well, I'll tell you, man. That, that is WD GAN 101. He loves those calendar year uh, pivots. So certainly nothing to do here now. Look how wide these moving averages are. There's no, no sell signal anywhere in place. So, you know, as long as these things are pointing up, anybody can do this. It's such a simple, simple uh, system. Sometimes it'll flash, you know, sell signals and then flash right back to buy. 
So you got to get right back in on the trade. But a lot of times they'll, they'll just act like this. And you should be long and don't fight the trend here. You can also see on a weekly basis, looks like volume is ramping up here as well. So we're not getting any volume impetus signals here. If anything, the bulls are wide awake. Uh, and interesting, even off the weekly basis, Willie's not stupid. Willie's got lots and lots of room to run here. So I've made the argument recently that Bitcoin usually likes to top out about a month ahead of the halving event. And when we look at the Bitcoin chart, I think eh, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I could very easily see this move on for another four candles, right? Uh, which would be uh, one, two, uh, three, four. And I think the happening event is like here. So maybe even five candles. I could very easily see another five. Uh, what the hell this shit is. Uh, I could very easily see another five candles of this thing moving up into fog and bombs, into A, B, C, D objectives, into trend line resistance kind of idea. Very easily see five candles. Boom, 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 boom. That sucks Willie back into overbought. You know, notice we don't have a momentum breakout here. You know, five candles, we might just work our way up and test these highs. And now that price is so close to breaking out, in fact, did it break out here? It looks like it has. 193.64, 1, uh, 187, so it has. And you can see momentum is not breaking to new highs. So you could argue that the potential bearish momentum divergence is starting to form. But as we said there a moment ago, lots of buyers still coming in here. So the volume impetus signal is not done. Notice here when we had huge buyers come in here, well, we had to take a little while and go sideways here. So, you know, is that the end of that buying push? I don't know. I don't think so. Because we did just break out here. It almost feels like, you know, kind of like what I said there a few minutes ago, you know, we have four or five candles to go until that topping point. Maybe this is this bar here today is like this bar here and you got one, two, three, which carves your inside bar. And then four candles from now, we actually get your sell signal and that's the end of the bull run. I could very easily see that. Wouldn't surprise me one bit. And you could even make an argument off of the weekly charts that we're already coming into these 2.618s here. You know? And, you know, I might make the argument, really simply put, that had you come in and bought down here at $50, $60, $70, I mean, at 180 at the very least, what should you be doing? Should you not be selling half to establish risk-free trades? Get yourself, uh, get all your original investment capital back in your hands, and now you're just playing with the market's money? I mean, it's, it's the smart way to play this game. Uh, I don't know whether the public understands that, but... It's the way the pros play it. Anyway, it is what it is. Uh, let's see. Any other crypto coins that are, uh, excuse me. You know, actually, one name that's caught my attention here, good old Novogratz. I even retweeted something that he said here earlier this morning. I don't know whether Luna's coming back in earnest, but it is interesting to see Novogratz is actually barking publicly again. So he must be feeling a little bit more confident. He also, uh, I think, participated in the Bitcoin ETF orgy there. So he must have made a bunch of money floating that Bitcoin ETF. And so now he's feeling pretty liquid. Interesting how off of this fog and bomb, bang, right into 2.618. We had to back off. We came back. We tested the original breakout there. It held the 13 EMA. Remember, we just talked a few minutes ago about moving average relationships here. So still uber bullish. We came back down. We tested the breakout. It held. And now we're moving up through 2.618. My hunch is next stop on this bad boy is uh, 4.669. And also nice gap fills up here. You can see a big old gap right there to be filled in. Um, and the, well, actually, this is an interesting image. Watch what happens when we go boom, boom. So I think that that trend line will act as just a horrific brick wall of resistance when we get to it. Uh, and your buy signal was the first W on the other side of this trend line. Boop, there's your W, there's your buy signal. 
at about five, six bucks. That's actually exactly where I bought. So actually I'm feeling pretty good about this. I suppose when I get back home, if prices are still feeling uppy here into the end of the month, which I don't see any reason why they wouldn't, um, I probably should be selling halves on doubles and establishing risk-free Novogratz is Novogratz is, <laughs> is that a word? I don't know. Interesting how 877 here, and this is what I was commenting about earlier. Uh, interesting how if we do, you know, just a fib, say, off of this range right here, what do you think the odds are that my reload zone is going to line up, especially against this uh, key pivot high right here? I think there's, uh, you can almost see the confluence of reasons why this thing's going to stall out here somewhere between about, let's call it 27 to 30. 31, 32, 33, somewhere in that area there. So even from 12 bucks, that's still a triple. And of course, from our $5 buy level, Jesus, we're feeling pretty damn good. My right, my, my retirement account's going to thank me. Also too, man, this is a really good lesson for all of you. Take a screen. I don't know whether you guys want to get good at this technical analysis shit or you're just listening for my uh, travel tips uh, going through Central America. I doubt that that's the case, but. I mean, this was such an excellent, excellent analogy of uh, weekly uh, bullish momentum divergences. In fact, I used to have one guy that I worked with years ago. Uh, I always like making reference to him because he's probably richer than all of us put together with his Bitcoins. Um, and it's not Da Vinci. In fact, it's a guy who I was pretty pissed off at Da Vinci for stealing his work. <laughs> but we won't go there today. Anyway, point of the matter here is he absolutely loves these weekly bullish divergences. And hopefully you can see that. Take a screenshot of that, right? Note that this is a weekly price chart. Note that price down here was back at the bottom end of the range. Note the big honking bullish divergence that was confirmed right here. This is all the anecdotal evidence you need that we have completely wiped out all these suckers that came in and bought up here. And now the market is actually at this point right here is much, much stronger than what price itself is leading you to believe. And sure enough, six, eight months later, we're starting to climb the wall of worry. Here we go. And of course, we'll get everybody to come rah-rah in, piling to buy back in at the top, create another big wick, a whole bunch of trap bulls. And, you know, Brian's going to be barking there. You should be selling, you idiots. What are you doing? Anyway. So, uh, Novogratz is looking pretty uppy. I don't see any reason to step back. I mean, the problem here is, can you actually buy that level? Absolutely not. In fact, you know, we were talking earlier about potential, you know, stock market itself has gone and divved out. Now you can make the argument exact opposite to what all this was. I think you can actually make the argument that a potential bearish div is starting to form. And this one's actually a little bit spooky because I don't know whether this high is higher. Is that high higher? No, it is not. So really, you can make the argument there is a huge potential bear div forming. If we get if momentum, you know, following the happening, everybody calms down from all the stupid orgy crap. Right. If we go through that low, that will give you a bearish divergence. But this is going to be an example of one of my double Ds. And of course, you know how much Brian loves his big fat double Ds. So you can see there, there is potential trouble on the horizon. So, you know, if you want to use Novogratz as sort of a proxy of how healthy uh, the crypto space is, you know, whatever projects he's working on. I uh, keep an eye on how this uh, this potential divergence situation plays itself out here. So anyway, lots of fun. Point here is uh, still pointing up. I wouldn't get in front of him. No sell signals just yet. Hopefully you got long off of the W's off of the bottom and you're just slowly spoon feeding the market coin. All right, that's what you should be doing here. All right, that is noon. So uh, maybe we'll just leave it at a couple names uh, for the stock market. Take a quick boo at uh, Yield Corn. Let's give you an update on what we're seeing there. And then uh, we had one options related question uh, from one of our level oneers here this term. Uh, and then I think we'll call it a day. Of course, I still have to do uh, Liam. Regardless of whether I'm on vacation or not, Liam doesn't understand any of that kind of stuff and he's not very happy right now. So I got to get psyched to have a meeting with him. 
and see if I can somehow put a smile on his face here today. So um, Bitcoin weekly chart, you know, it kind of posted. Um, I like to try and do this. I know, of course, with this past couple of weeks with this trip and everything, been a little bit difficult. And my apologies, any sort of followers who feel as though they're getting gypped. They, uh, I'm trying my best to give you guys value. Hope you guys feel, at least site participation wise, feel that uh, your time at TRI is well spent. But uh, here was my comment here from uh, from uh, the uh, weekly Bitcoin price chart that we put up on uh, on Twitter. Um, as we commented about uh, coin, I guess we commented about Novigrad, same sort of thing. Um, interesting how this is so blurry here. Quite sure what I'm missing here. Uh, there we go. That's a little better. Uh, a to B, C to D. We've actually gone through a lot of my sort of anticipated price objectives. I thought we'd rally up into 61.8. The last two pre havening cycle uh, uh, rally um, um, events. And I scroll through my uh, my Twitter feed uh, about a month or two ago. I did a study on, on the previous events, and they, you know, the pre havening rally was up into 0.618. So it seemed logical that we needed to get up there. Also seemed logical too. You know, if we started to actually turn back up, look left, where is key resistance? Um, this was the last time somebody said, hey, no more up, you go down, or basically come in and stop the bull institutional fingerprint. So we call it there on uh, in the education program. Might even argue that this also, too, was also an institutional fingerprint. So... To me, it's the, as well, you know, lastly, uh, we had sort of a smattering of an inverted head and shoulders, not really the prettiest inverted head and shoulders, but I do think legit. Uh, and that, uh, based on these yellow lines, projected a move up here into sort of high 49, low 50 area. Then also, too, lastly, you know, big fat round number, $50,000. Seemed pretty logical that it needed to be traded to. That's more human psychology than anything else. Uh, our most recent rally peak, 52,800 and change. Is there any particular reason why this thing should stop here? Well, we are flirting with this high here, and this might be one of these look left kind of scenarios. You can see we rallied up to this peak here. That's there, there. Then uh, we pulled back all the way down to here. So that's this pullback all the way down into here. Then we went rallying up into here and rallying up into here. You notice this pullback here comes all the way back to this yellow line here, that low of that tail. So that would bring us back to basically this trend line, which would be like, what's that? About 42, 43,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. I could very easily see us maybe make like some sort of fractal top. And this ultimately looks like some sort of head and shoulders uh, as we uh, transition our way through this halvening event. Um, previous cycles, the post halvening event. And I think that this cycle is actually gonna look a lot like the 14, 15, 16 bottom. Uh, so if we actually pull up the chart itself, um, <laughs> What I actually have here is I've taken that 1415 cycle and sort of overlaid it here. It's a little bit sloppy, but eh, hopefully you can get the idea. So uh, market uh, bottoms and works its way up. Havening events, uh, market peaks about a month ahead of the havening event. And I get the impression what's going to happen here. Uh, and it does make sense to me, especially the way the crypto kids are acting and talking right now is I think that this is going to be a very sharp, very quick pullback. I hear everybody and their brother saying, oh, I'm, you know, I, I, I miss loading up, including myself, for that matter. Uh, but I miss loading up here. But any kind of pullbacks, you know, and especially if we get reload zones, you know, that Beamish guy saying reload zones, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
uh, the every everybody that I talk to, every you know, all the people here, any kind. If it pulls back at all, I'm so gonna buy. I'm so gonna buy. I'm so loading up. I'm so getting ready. That to me says there's probably not going to be that much of a pullback here. Uh, and as I said, 15, 16 cycle, this is basically just a bar pattern of that. What this ended up happening being was, um, and I just took this, it ended up happening being an A to B, and then counter trend rally, C to D, and that's it. Bang, 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 nail 50% level, came back into the previous consolidation zone, and I think that this consolidation zone, this go round, was all about. Remember Peter Fink? Is that his name? Peter Fink? Oh, dickhead. Whatever the hell we want to call him. Larry, um, Larry Fink. Larry Fink. There you go. Um, he came out. Remember last summer? I want my ETF. God damn it! Quit taking the price down. Right? Kind of idea and put this base in. Uh, in the fourteen fifteen cycle, you know, this was the uh, second Silk Road auction. Uh, and then we kind of went sideways, rallied up. Uh, and then, of course, we had the happening event sort of hangover, which was just nothing more than just a 50% retracement of this whole rally off of the lows. And it happens in a very, very quick A, a B, C, D, bang, 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 bang. And I suppose probably the easiest way for you to see this. Um, I always like the stockcharts.com. Good old John Murphy. Uh, he's a really good source for sort of, you know, learning this stuff. You want to learn Elliott Wave? Uh, Elliott Wave's a, a, it, it is a very, the only problem with Elliott Wave is it's extremely uh, subjective, but usually the up move, it's one, two, three, four, five, where two to three has to be the biggest wave. Try and remember that. It's, it's pretty straightforward. But more importantly, the corrections Usually corrections in Elliott Waves go A, they they call them A, B, Cs. But if you think about it from a harmonic, A, B, C, D, A to B, A, B equals C, D is the harmonic expression. But I think that our correction is going to look something like this. You know, you could even make an argument, bang, 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 uh, bang, 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 bang. This is what I think you're going to see. And unfortunately, what it means is this B to C could be insanely violent. And because there's so many people, and I, like I said, I mean, I've talked to just tons of people on the road here, and they're all saying, oh my God, if crypto pulls back, I'm so going to load up because I'm the one who's going to make a billion dollars, blah, 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 blah. So, and I kind of remember the last time we went through this, the same sort of thing happened. And a lot of people were like, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy. And it, the correction was fast and furious. Here it is. Uh, I saw this stuff on the chart. Uh, I think this is what your correction is going to look like. It's going to be fast. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be violent. So, you know, uh, happening events right here. Rally pre happening event. Market loves to top out about a month or so ahead of the happening event. What scares me is I actually have people that I work with that are saying, oh, no, Brian, this time it's different. And it's like, oh, no. Uh, we're using monkey la la internet. <laughs> so sorry, everybody. <laughs> monkey la la. <laughs> uh, anyway, oh, there's my camera. I'm back. I don't. I don't know what. What uh, can somebody over on YouTube tell me what you last heard? Where were we? Did we get to the? Oh, this time it's different. Talk. That was the same thing. Monkey Lala. <laughs> okay. Thank you, snowboarding JJ. So anyway, the point of the matter here is I think that this is what our bull market is. And I think this last uh, summer and that comment about uh, Dickhead Fink uh, putting a bottom in the market through the summer, I think that's exactly what this is. And you notice that the pullback following the happening event, they dipped it violently right back into that level, but look how quick the the correction was. Just zing straight down, zing right back up, 
and then resume the merge higher. So take a screenshot of this. I, I think that our future is going to look almost exactly like this. I mean, it's quite shocking how similar current price action is to that image. So uh, also, too, you notice there is the 13 EMA, 30 SMA. Uh, even through this entire correction here, that moving our average relationship did not change one bit. And I think that's also similar to how we look right now. So if we fast forward back to today, there is our crazy ass moving averages. There is a uh, monkey la la fink bad boy there and his previous market lows. And there is the 50% level if this is the actual high. And notice that's basically right back into that consolidation window. If we get a, a violent dip that actually does take us all the way back into reload zones, then actually I think that's a pretty damn sexy buy. This is going to be tricky because it's not really technically a buy. It's more like a pullback within a bull market. So tough one. Anyway. Um, so moving averages are pointing up, you know, even if we look at the weekly price chart, it's a little bit bothersome. Willie is actually officially stupid. So uh, interesting. The last time we did this, we said Willie was almost stupid. That was probably when we were over here. Now, unfortunately, I think we do have to say Willie is stupid. So there's another anecdote that we can't really be buyers here now. Uh, and interesting, uh, we don't have any confirmed divs here on the weekly price chart, but you can see that the weekly div is starting to form. I think we said that we had daily divs uh, starting to pop up. So again, I mean, almost all of you, I don't think there's anybody that watches our channel now that would be so foolish as to think that Brian's going to come out and say, hey, you know what? Go and buy Bitcoins here. Technical analysis doesn't matter. You get rich. You know, I, I, I'm not going to be a guy to say that. If anything, uh, if you did want to buy, remember the ETF event, and then we had the dump, which took us right back down into moving average support. I was pretty impressed seeing some guys on the site step in and buy that. And really what that was, was we had actually a really pretty inverted head and shoulders uh, that came up here on like the lower time frames. That was this setup here. You know, you could have bought this uh, inverted head and shoulders, or you could have waited a little bit more and bought this inverted head and shoulders. That took you uh, right back up into the topping here. But the problem is now look at this nasty bear div. Look at Willie Stupid. Look at RSI rolling over here. And, you know, we have the confirmed bear divs that actually all fired here. Willie is stupid, and I don't know, can anybody tell me, is there a letter of the alphabet that's working away here? And this is actually surprised me. Somebody had said earlier today, oh, you know what? There's a guy on the site who's getting, who's going long. And I was like, ooh, really? Yeah, be careful. Anyway, so boobity-boo, boobity-boo. Look at that. Holy trend line rejection. I mean, that's exactly what you want to see, right? And... You know, uh, especially that, um, what's that? I always forget what the fuck his name is. Anyway, ICT guy or whatever. I think he would probably say something like, um, I don't know, maybe that's uh, a market structure shift on a break of that low there. I don't know. I can't quote him. But anyway, we stop making higher highs and higher lows, and we actually start breaking through some recent higher lows. Uh, so clearly the market has shifted here. This new M now has actually uh, formed itself. And I might even argue, you know, again, don't quote me on this. I don't know the guy from Adam, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that was one of those, you know, fair value gap kind of things. So all they did was rally the market right back into that original top. And now it's starting to roll back over. And I got to say, you know, uh, there was a guy on the site who I was really impressed with who stepped up and shorted uh, Ethereum yesterday on a really nice, uh, maybe it was a couple of days ago, on a nice top. I'd be curious to see how he's doing. I don't know whether that's still working or not, but let's go take a look for fun. Uh, doo, doo, doo. Oh, maybe he got busted out here. 
Oh, no, still working. <laughs> How ironic. You know, here, this, if anything, is a really good example where maybe you need to pay yourself a little bit uh, just so if it does happen to come back on you, you get, uh, you've get you actually made a bit of money. I don't know. It's a tough one. Hindsight's always 20, 20 eh? But uh, there's your trend line off of the top. And of course, our rule is break the trend line and then give us a W on the other side of the trend line to actually get a buy signal. I don't think this top has actually been broken yet, which is kind of interesting. So, um. Actually, I hate to say it, but actually that Bitcoin top looks really pretty right here. I mean, that looks textbook. If you're, uh, you know, one of those trader guys, then, uh, you know, I personally, of course, if I was doing this, I'd want to hunt that 78.6 level. You know how much I love that. So where's that? Oh, yeah, he's all the way up there. So you got your 61.8 mountain man. And you know what I noticed this? This is also something that you should write down too is I noticed that this ICT guy, I, know, I think it's called, uh, I, I don't even know what the name of his setup is. Uh, but I, I did notice that um, I've seen a few references that this fair value gap, if I'm even identifying it right, I don't know if I am or not. Uh, but it, the top of it often lines up nicely with Mountain Man 61.8 fib uh, levels. So Eh, it wouldn't surprise me if that actually was a top and then we started to roll back over and head back down. That wouldn't shock me at all. I think we said just a moment ago that this, uh, and actually not off, let's leave this on the four hour, um, that this market is in divergence, isn't it? I think it is. Wow, isn't that interesting? Look at that image. Where the hell are the buyers? I thought you guys loved this thing. So you can see we're going to get a volume impetus sell signal here. If we do an up bar less than, what's that volume right there? 951 coins. If you see a green up candle, like if this thing, and you can see it's just sitting as a doji right now. This thing could very easily just tick up as a green candle. And right now this candle is only 655 coins. If we get a green candle that's lower than that number right there, that 951, that's a volume impetus sell signal. And you better be careful, kids. Um, daily momentum doesn't look like it's in divergence here. So, But you can see Willie's stupid, so I, I don't have permission to be able to be a buyer here. I think as we said there just a few minutes ago, the buy signal clearly was off of that. What's that? 43,000 area. And we've actually already hit the inverted head and shoulders price objective. I think you should be ringing the register up here, but that's just me. So anyway, I think if I'm not mistaken, Seward was telling the community that he was going to be letting some go up top here of uh, TRI holdings. And I think on balance, that's not, not a bad idea. Um, also too, I suppose, you know, Colin and the pump chasers, uh, I actually like the idea that what ends up happening here is this carves out just a massive uh, head and shoulders top, which means we're probably going to have to come back down, maybe tag this uh, trend line into Collins, uh, you know, pump chaser zone, maybe put in some sort of bottom, then rally back up. Uh, if we can't take out, let's uh, redo that. If we can't take out this high right here, then I think you have actually a, a really high probability that this is some sort of head and shoulder stop. And that also could create our A to B. Uh, let's maybe make this yellow or something. And then C to D kind of idea. Boom, 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 boom. Having events done. Uh, you get that A to B, C to D, or if you want to call it the Elliott wave correction, uh, what, A, B, C, get all that done. I guess happening events over here, so maybe somewhere over here kind of idea. I mean, this, you know, maybe this thing goes, you know, uh, you know, doesn't have to be straight line. Maybe it's something like that, right? But anyway, point here is... Uh, uh, get that correction done, bring us back down into long-term support kind of idea, uh, clean out all this excess overboughtness, get Willie out of the overbought, uh, you know, have that flash crash, and then we can start the next sort of basing period at taking us into the summer. So, anyway, uh, okay, so that's kind of what I'm thinking with the corn. Way too late to be a buyer. Uh, probably should be taking some profits. Uh, and uh, way, way too early to actually 
talk about end of uptrends. In fact, actually, I think uh, pullbacks are buying opportunities. That's the way I'm looking at all this. Uh, finish off this uh, this broadcast here with a quick boo at some of the poop coins. Gotta say, man, they're, they're, it, it's a lot of fun watching them. That's for damn sure. Uh, where's my poop coin list? Poop coin, poop coin, crypto, crypto charts. Jesus, look at that. That looks nasty. 30 minute, that's a sell signal right there. Jesus, you know what? Just for fun? Hello, uh, what the hell? Uh, let's, let's see what we'll do. Uh oh, no, oh, no. I don't know what the fuck this is. <laughs> All right, well, I guess can't do that. Anyway, oh yeah, I thought we had the paper trading thing here. I always like to do this, and I think it's a, uh-oh, no, they don't like me. All right, well, that was fun. I think it would be a, a really good uh, demonstration. You know, just get into the habit of practicing, right? That's a double top right there. <clears throat> so uh, no reason why you couldn't uh, short that right there risk to new these the double top high all right something along those lines add two to one if this thing does puke out you look to sell half of the position right and just book that profit and really you know i don't think it should surprise if we go boo ba boo right all we're doing is we're just asking the market to come back down into reload zones you can see there's a cute little gap right here right right there so that could be a perfectly legit target, a test of these lows. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, and move your stop to scratch. Once you've had that two to one get hit, then who knows where the hell the market's going to take you. But look at this momentum. Wow, that looks horrible. Anyway, fascinating to see that happen. We'll leave that on. Uh, I think I told you just a few minutes or at the start of the broadcast, I'm going to take a week or two off. I really need to actually try and make this some sort of vacation time for me so that when I do come back, I'm all full of enthusiasm and, and positivity-ality. Is that such a term? I don't know. Um, so I think I'm probably going to take, uh, take this next couple of weeks. I'm going to be driving back from L.A. up to Vancouver by myself uh that takes about four days uh unto itself so um i might do shows but it might just be splotchy but you know uh, if anything i you know the higher time frame uh look that we had there just a second ago off of something like this i think i'm gonna try and leave that on this screen and let's see what this looks like let's see how this develops over time um so we wanted to look at some of the poop coins if anything you know a good example of um i don't know whether it's an example of the end of the move but usually what ends up happening i've personally found is um you know the market sort of trends happily along its way and then all of a sudden we go into sort of orgy mode and of course, crypto Twitter comes alive. Public comes piling in at the top of the market and buy, 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 buy. And it's a trap. That's yeah, pretty typical. I've been noticing a lot of names have been popping up, but the, you know, you should be able to look at some of these names. And I mean, you can see them there. You know, they're double digit moves higher here on the day. There was one that uh, popped violently for me yesterday that we happened to have bought six, eight months ago kind of idea. Uh, and it's such a great analogy of this space right now. Um, I think it was this LPT. I mean, I certainly don't have any, uh, well, actually, maybe I do have a railroad check. So that's a 30-minute chart, though, so I don't know whether I'd be day trading this kind of stuff. But, uh, I mean, you tell me. Uh, do you really want to come in on the buy side here now? Maybe should you not be maybe selling into that euphoria? And that's what I'm seeing a lot of right now is uh, people that, you know, stepped up and did crazy things like bought W's. In fact, actually, the tweet that I put out here uh, earlier today, I think is actually maybe it was a couple of days ago. It was absolutely sort of exactly what I'm worried about here. And maybe worried's not the right word. I mean, the public is always going to do, you know, stupid trades and you're never going to be able to. I've been at this damn game trying to, quote unquote, teach the public. And what's ended up for 10 years now, what's ended up happening is the people that really want to learn, they learn. 
the general public, they don't give a fuck and they just don't listen. And they never learn, never, ever, ever learn. So, uh, you know, just on uh, recent social media, oh, did we lose the connect? Oh, it looks like we're still alive. Uh, what's going on here? Why won't that click? Uh, oh, okay. Anyway, so I put out a, um, a tweet along the lines of, you know, I, I don't know whether this is the LTO. This might be a different one. This is CHR. I mean, same logic. I mean, anybody that uh, participates on the site knows exactly what I, and of course I post all these damn trades on the site. So, I mean, you can go into Brian's trade room and find the trade in there. Should really try and blog and sort of publish these things a little bit better. Maybe over time we'll get around to it. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I went in on the buy side down here. And the question is, I mean, should you be buying when a chart looks like that? Is that even somewhat responsible? The answer is clear, no. It's it's completely irresponsible. You're just asking for trouble. And of course, you know, wicks and tails like to be eaten. Where are these guys sleeping now? Uh, who knows how long this lasts? Maybe if they're lucky, uh, there's still another higher high here. But how many charts have you seen me over the years? Market will work its way back down and we'll be like, look at those trapped bulls up there. So you can, I would argue that this market that we're in right now, right this very moment, they are creating trapped bulls. Trapped bulls are, are literally, they don't realize that they're going to be trap bulls, but you know, kind of like this spike up here, this spike up here. I think you can make the argument, especially now that we're coming into some pretty important technical sort of resistance levels, they are probably establishing trapped bulls as we speak. And you can go name by name by name by name by name. I mean, they all look like they're moving up. And of course, this is the classic analogy that what we were supposed to do is come in and buy when other people are crying and then sell when other people are yelling. Uh, the public is yelling. I mean, I go out, uh, we've been to a couple sort of, you know, crypto-ish sort of uh, events here, uh, just even as we've been sort of on the road, and you can see the public is starting to get rah, rah, rah. And there's one gentleman in Sacramento that I've been pleading with to try and slow down. Adam has a... Uh, has a um... Oh, Jimmy says hello, by the way. He just texted me. Jimmy? Yeah. All right on. Oh, hi, Jimmy. I wasn't going to name names, but now we everybody knows who he is. Jimmy, don't chase. <laughs> you are not allowed to chase. <laughs> so, you know, there's a ton of names that look like this. Ironically enough, there are a couple fun little, I'll give you one idea that actually I did buy recently, but hopefully you see that, you know, especially if we go to like a daily chart, I mean, uh, this is what this market looks like right now. I mean, there's no, you can't buy that. You know, and all these damn trap bulls, they're, they're being created as we speak. You're going to be sleeping in the doghouse, right, Joe? You know you know the answer to that, Joe. Joe, uh, coinage fame. <laughs> I think I've got him now out of the doghouse. <laughs> Abigail, right? That, that, that's what his girlfriend? Yeah, I think, uh, ah, mind you, she's a sweetheart. She wouldn't make Joe sleep in a doghouse. I don't think so. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'll, I'll leave off this uh, segment uh, talking about poop coins with, you know, you should be taking profits on names that look like this. What are names that maybe you can actually consider buying? And here's a fun one. We've been flipping it back and forth. And I get the impression what ends up happening is uh, when the broader market is all orgy, 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 uh, these kind of names don't really do anything. We're now over in Solana land. This is bros. And actually, this is the name that was uh, mentioned to me by one of our uh, site members uh, as a half-decent fundamental idea. Um, this was kind of an interesting one because it came right out of the gate and it, it moved up so fast, so quickly that I wasn't able to get in on this. And I said, well, okay, well, I'll wait for the market to sort of settle down back against the bottom end of its range. So, and hopefully you can see W's coming in here, picked it up, was able to sell half on a double, Got my original money back, and then it started to work its way back down. And lo and behold, 
Look at the beautiful W's coming back in here. So what's Brian do like a doofus? I go and buy W's. I mean, it's just what I do. <laughs> Starting to work its way up. If you want to join me, probably not a good idea to chase that number there. Maybe throw in a stink bid down here. You can see where I got filled all right through this area here. Uh, but, you know, this is a great example. Buy against the, the bottom end of the range. Sell halves on doubles, establish risk-free trades. Here we are back down the bottom end of the range. Going to come in back and buy some more. And now anybody who says, well, Brian, you know, yeah, it's one thing to tell us, yeah, you're banging out doubles and oh, aren't you wonderful. But do you ever tell us about actually when you buy? Well, there you go, folks. There is a perfect example of something where I just went and bought. Whether you want to participate with me or not, it's entirely up to you. I couldn't give a rat's ass whether you buy this or not. It's I don't have any vested interest one way or the other, but I'll tell you what I'm doing with my money. I went and picked up some of this down here. It's a cute little name. So anyway, we'll see what happens. Only time will tell. And the good part about this portfolio, this is a classic little old lady. Uh, kind of portfolio. No position is greater than 5% risk of the original capital. And we're just slowly building up our list of SOL uh, names. This one happened to pop up as something that I actually think was worth buying. So I wanted to mention to you guys yet today. So there you go. Um, all right. Uh, I think what we'll do is we will circle back around. Uh, there was one question it's a bit of an esoteric question, so I don't know if it's uh, really going to excite the crypto audience too much. But the primary purpose of this uh, Sunday uh, show was to uh, dovetail, especially when we have really big level one classes, uh, to dovetail with our current level one instructor, Grim, uh, and just see if there was any sort of uh, follow up questions that were asked that uh we just, uh, Grim didn't have the time to get to. Uh, or if there happened to be um, questions that, you know, maybe Brian could answer from sort of a broker perspective. You know, Grim's never been a broker. Uh, that maybe I can help uh, under uh, explain with that. So with that said, oh, look at that. We actually have a couple extra questions. So let's pop on over here. I guess today's the 18th being uh, most recent entry here. Uh, and uh, we'll answer these questions and then we'll send you good people on your way. So question number one. Hi, Brian, Dan here. In this week's uh, lecture on risk management, the mind uh, two rules to investing. Uh, if you follow the rules, it's actually difficult to lose money in this game. The only problem is nobody ever follows the rules. So rule number two of Brian's two rules of investing, don't risk more than 5% of your stake on any idea ever. And really, most futures traders, they even do a uh, uh, substantially less percentage than that. But the rule is never, ever, ever let a single position hurt you more than 5% of your portfolio. So uh, they are all diligently working away on trying to figure out what type of risk takers they are in the marketplace. So good on you, level oneers. You are at that point. And this is where Jimmy and Liz, you guys have to figure out my hunch is you both of you are little old ladies. Even though uh, probably calling Jimmy a little old lady will probably get a punch in the nose. So I better be careful there. But I still think you're a little old lady, Jimmy. <laughs> Between me and you. <laughs> uh, all right. So the point here is they are on to risk management. Great to see Dan working away. Keep in mind, the only reason why we mention options um, in the level one program, and especially in this particular week, as insurance for your portfolio. And to be perfectly blunt with you, I think that 90%, oh, there's Chris. Hi, Chris. 90% <laughs> of the public that does participate in options, they should only use options as insurance products. So that's the context of the conversation here, uh, Dan. Uh, these are insurance products. And what we're really doing here in this week is we're trying to illustrate, given the current market's volatility, what is the cost to insure your portfolio? So just think about it, right? If you happen to live in a very high sort of flood prone area of the world, 
And then all of a sudden you go into rainy season and the floods start. Or is your flood insurance, if you want to open up a brand new policy, is it going to be expensive? Is there going to be an added premium to it because you're buying right in the rainy season as floods are happening? Probably. So what I need for you to do, and this may take months, it may take years. In fact, a really good exercise, uh, hopefully, Dan, when you get to the end of level three, you'll be working with me for a good year or two years. What I like to do when you actually do get to sort of the options trading uh, part of the level three education program, and if we're really lucky, uh, we can still have Zach on the uh, on the site uh, teaching the level four advanced spread trading strategies. Man, I love those spreads. If anything, if I had my druthers, I would probably want to concentrate more of my time and effort on spread trading than anything else. But anyway, if we can get you to that point, which is a year or two down the road, then what I want you to do is I want you at that point to go into the marketplace and do the same exercise that I'm having you do now and compare how, given whatever the current market state is, uh, how the cost to insure your portfolio has either gone up or down uh, relative to what the market has done since you took the level one course. And you'd be quite surprised at the dramatic change in insurance premiums given market state. Now, the question I'd have for you right off the bat is what's the current market state? Is the market crashing right now? I don't think so. In fact, if I actually look at the stock market, I think everybody's all happy. Hey, look at the S&P 500's at new highs. NASDAQ going to new highs. So what is the propensity for people to bid up the put insurance policies and make them more expensive? Well, if, if puts are not making any money right now uh, because the market is not going down, then that means that the VIX or the volatility index is probably very low right now, relatively speaking. And because the VIX index itself is a component in the pricing of these options, if the VIX index itself is really low, then that means the relative cost to buy an insurance policy should be relatively low. That's the point of this exercise, Dan. There really is no other takeaway from this module. What you need to understand is what is the cost to actually insure your portfolio? Nothing to do with trade setups, nothing to do with we're teaching you strategies on how to trade options. It's the only purpose of this is for you to understand the cost to insure a portfolio of stocks. All right, so having said that, let's move on with this question. You talk about buying a put option one year out, would this be a leap? Yep, usually options that are a year in duration are called leaps. Long-term equity asset participation security. There you go. <laughs> How can you tell I was a broker? as portfolio insurance. When assessing the put option for one year from now, what qualities am I looking for? You're not looking for any qualities. What I'm asking you to do here is just go and price them. We're not looking for, hey, this is a really good deal. This isn't a good deal. What I just want you to do is know what's it gonna cost you. So, you know, with the market, and it would have been good for you to actually write down what the index actually finished at, I mean, I get the impression here that uh, the index probably finished at like 4927, 4928, all the way up to maybe, uh, well, it didn't go out at 4950, right? So it's finished somewhere in here. <clears throat> also, too, um, I don't see the reference here. Is this on the SPY? I don't know what you're pricing here. Um, I think the spiders just crossed the 5,000. I'd also like you to be looking at the spiders as well. So that's the SPY. I think you're looking at the actual index itself. And I, I would prefer you to do this exercise with the SPY 
because it's on 100 shares. Uh, every stock option is always on 100 shares. Um, so it makes it relatively easy to do how many of these options do I have to buy to replicate a specific, you know, let's say a quarter million dollar uh, portfolio of stocks. If you're going to do the index itself, this is going to get a little tricky. Um, I don't know what the multiplier is here of this uh, unit. Is it $1? Could be. So what I would rather you do, Dan, is let's let's go back. And, uh, you know, you've done bar chart here. <clears throat> yeah, this is the index. I would much rather you do this off of SPY, which is the S&P 500 Depository Receipts. So this is actually the very first ETF that was floated a million years ago. Um, and if we do that one year option, so let's go look at like uh, uh, January, uh, here, January 2025. So that's one year. Here's our insurance policy. And as we said, we've got 499.51. So let's call it 500, nice and easy. As you're at the money position, yeah, so I have a funny feeling that this option that you've quoted, and it's important, Dan, that you actually write down specifically what is the actual one point is here. And I think it's $2.50. Remember, as I said, on stock options, this is on 100 shares. So the multiplier is just basically 100. <laughs> so what this is saying, and these are the calls, right? And we said we were going to go price. Put insurance. So there is your, actually, no, look, that's been at the same price, 2268. So I stand corrected, right? You've got uh, 2287. And interesting how there's a difference here. So it'd be interesting too to see where this actually settled out. What was the moment that you took the screenshot? I mean, a whole bunch of nuances here. But in essence, uh, there's that 5,000 strike. That's 2436. We said over here, this 500 is 2268. Eh, pretty close. So what I would just simply say is this is this option to buy the $500 put. It's going to cost you $22.68 times 100. So on 100 shares and 100 shares times $500, that comes out to what? 50,000 bucks. Uh, I think the question in your homework, and it'll be a question on the exam, is you want to insure a portfolio of, say, $100,000. I think that's what it is. Maybe it's $250,000. You're going to have to divide that $50,000, and lucky for you, this is a nice even round number. So if it's a $100,000 portfolio, you're going to have to buy two of these. If it's a $250,000 portfolio, you're going to have to buy five of these. But the point is... How many of these options are you going to have to buy to buy a complete 100% insurance policy on that $250,000 or $100,000, whatever it is, uh, portfolio of stocks? We've also, you don't need to really worry about this too much. Again, the whole purpose of this exercise was just to get your head wrapped around what's it going to cost to buy insurance. Uh, there's another variable involved here. It's called beta, but don't worry about it. We're just going to assume that the beta of your stock portfolio is exactly the same as the beta of the S&P 500 or one-to-one. -one. Just nice and simple. Don't, don't overthink this. Again, the whole purpose of this exercise was just for you to understand how much an insurance policy was going to cost. So $22.68 on a $500 asset times 100 means that the asset itself at 500 is worth $50,000. And you should be able to do the math. $22.68 times 100 should come out to 2,268 bucks. So what's that saying? What it's saying is, is that to buy one year of insurance on this $50,000 asset, it's going to cost you about 4%. 3.8, 3.9, anybody got a calculator? You can come up with the number. And then what I need you to do is over time, track how this premium has changed. 
You know, if it's on a hundred thousand dollar asset, then that means you're going to have to buy two of them, which means that it's not twenty two hundred and sixty eight dollars. It's twenty four hundred twenty what twenty five hundred and thirty six bucks, right? Something like that. So the point here is, and the, the most important point of this is, it's only costing you four percent to buy that insurance policy. What you're going to find if you study this over time is that 4% is actually an incredibly low number for insurance. When the stock market's tanking and all hell's breaking loose, you're going to find that these premiums go up sometimes to like 15, 20%. So what I want you taking away from this is 4% premium to buy a one-year insurance policy is actually pretty cheap. But you're not going to know that unless, you know, keep in mind, remember we went through the whole S&P 500, what does the chart look like and what's the propensity for the market to move up or down where we are right now? And remember, we said, holy crap, this market's just going straight up. I think there is a pretty good chance that the market's going to come down. So remember, we have the cool your jets message from uh, MACD histogram. I guess you're going to learn that in the next couple of weeks. So you've already got to, you don't be a buyer here. You're an idiot if you're a buyer. But we don't quite have the, all oh, right, the market's actually a short and it's starting to break down. My hunch is the day that that happens, your premiums for your put options are actually going to start going up dramatically. This is pretty cheap. And probably the easiest way for you to see this in the market is if we pull up the VIX index. So if we do something like uh, VIX volatility index, oh, what a surprise. Look how it's down at the bottom end of the range. And, you know, big stock market thumpings there in October of last year when the market was tanking. Look how the VIX was all the way up here. This is like 22 when the market was tanking there last October. And right now the VIX is like almost half of that. It's 14. So just even if we go back to last October, kind of uh, what was the market doing in that kind of environment? Notice it was selling off. The premiums for your insurance policies in these down markets almost doubled relative to what they are now. Market's moving up. Nobody's thinking that the, the, the stock market's ever going to crash again. And so as a result, insurance, pre insurance premiums are actually very low. What do you think? Is that, that a pretty good answer? Is, uh, Dave, do you think I helped him out there? I'm, I'm asking the boss here. About him. <laughs> I, I don't know, Dan, if you're watching the call here or not. But I hope that that gives you some food for thought. And you might even have to go back and listen to uh, what I just said there two or three times uh, to really understand what I just said. I sure, I sure hope you got that. Let's see. Final comment he says here. For example, if I were to buy the 4925 put strike here and in six months time the market is down to at 4500 uh, would I have the ability to exercise it for profits because my belief is the market uh, goes back up or does it need to be held until expect? All right. So, well, that's a different conversation altogether. So that is uh, whether you're buying an American style put or a European style put. Uh, for the purposes of this conversation, uh, we are going to assume, again, don't want you buying these index options. I want you buying the option off of the ETF, which is a stock market proxy. And almost all options on the Chicago Board Options Exchange, which is where they trade stock options, almost all of these options are American style options, which means that they can be exercised at any given point in time. Now, what you want to do here for this exercise is you are not trading this. That was not the purpose of this exercise. And in level one, we are not teaching you to trade options for profit. That's not the purpose of this exercise. The purpose of this exercise was to show you 
what the cost of buying portfolio insurance is. Now, do you go and just halfway through your car insurance term say, hey, you know what? I, I bet, man, you know, the, the wife says I'm doing pretty good driving these days. I think I'm going to cancel my insurance policy. I don't need it anymore. Everybody says I'm a really good driver. I've gotten a lot better over the past six weeks. No, you just hold on to the policy because it is an insurance policy. So hopefully that speaks to that. You are not trading this. What should happen is if the market does sell off, then your portfolio that this was used to insure against, your portfolio is going to drop by this amount. And if had you not had the insurance policy, then you'd be out that. It'd be a paper loss, but you would still be out. The point here is that the put option should go up the equal amount in value, in essence, offsetting any losses realized by your actual stock portfolio. All right, so I hope that helps answer that question. Uh... Culture Media Asia. Is that you, Dan? Anyway, he says, uh, that person says, thank you. All right, cool. Well, uh, hopefully I did my job. Um, all right, on to the next question. Question number two. Hi, Brian. What is the best time frame to use with the bot setup? Thanks, David. I would prefer you, especially if you're asking, I don't know if this is a veteran on the site, but I would personally prefer that you guys stick with higher time frame charts. Higher time frame, the more conservative, the more slower, the better. Uh, could you trade bot setups off of tick charts in the futures? Sure, why not? But you're going to be setting yourself up with a lot of anxiety. And if you're coming to me as a level oneer saying, well, I've never worked with a trading plan. I haven't really traded setups before. I don't really know what divergence is. I don't quite understand what trade location is. I don't really understand market structure and all these kind of funny terminology. I don't want to throw you into the fucking sharks with the futures trading, trading off of tick charts. That's just setting you up for failure. Having said that, though, if you're like, well, I want to be a futures trader, do you want to sit there and just basically trade like 100 paper trades? off of like one minute, five minute charts, trading the bot like a badass, There's nothing wrong with that. And if you log those 100 trades and you're like, okay, I think I got the rhythm for this. I think I'm pretty good. And then you want to, like I tell you on the site, you know, and you know, the irony of it all is nothing changes with anything that I've said here over the past 10 years with you guys, right? This is all about the process. You know, Jimmy and Liz, they are learning the process right now. And all of you, should, you know, these two documents right here, this is your life. If you fancy yourself a trader, you got to put yourself on this, these, uh, you know, I suppose, um, I guess the team re, uh, I guess that's the introductory letter. I beg your pardon. Let's uh, go back and show you the evolutionary process of all traders. Nothing changes here. In fact, actually, I was joking with Jimmy when I was in Sacramento. I said, there you are, Jimmy, you handsome guy. You're a baby. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I really like these pictures. I don't know who came up with that. My, where's my favorite picture? Where the hell did they go? Anyway. Um, so, I mean, really, everybody should follow along at the bare minimum this cadence. You want to do this off five-minute chart? And if you find that you're making mistakes, then you have to reset the clock. If you can actually do 20 trades off a of five minute chart with bots uh, on your spreadsheet, logging everything, journaling everything, and you're not making any mistakes and you're like, okay, I think I got this set up down, then I'm more than happy for you to move on to one tenth account size trades, right? Maybe in the... Uh, the futures uh, market, you're trading those micro contracts, not the regulars, not even the minis. You're trading micros. Nothing wrong with that at all. You get again, can log now, you're up to like 40 trades. No mistakes, feeling pretty good about your behavior. 
just humming along, well, then I think you're ready for, for prime time. Time frame doesn't really make a difference. Try and remember the interesting thing about all of this is that the universe is a fractal. So ironically enough, you know, the way that we look at our solar system is a big circle. We look at our galaxy as a big circle. My hunch is that if we could get a camera that could zoom out big enough, I'd be willing to bet the galaxies themselves make some sort of big honking circle. It's, it's all just a fractal. And ironically enough, you know, and this is a great sales pitch, you know, Jimmy, you guys, you and Liz, you guys have to memorize these documents. It doesn't matter whether you are a daily investor or, you know, weekly investor, daily swing trader, four hour swing trader, you know, 30 minute day trader with Hogue uh, there at Topstead or, you know, even a five minute uh, chart trader. It doesn't matter. The process never changes. It's always exactly the same. So I don't know whether that answers your question, um, but uh, I don't think the bot really cares uh, time frame wise. But the issue here is that when you do trade off of lower time frames, you are opening yourself up for a lot more anxiety, especially if you're trading things like futures contracts, because then the leverage is going way up. And it's just a question of can you handle having to act very, very quickly without reservation? And a lot of people can't do that. And so as a result, the best thing for new people to trading to do is start at the highest time frame and work your way down slowly. All right, number three. Brian says, hi, Brian, can you please show us how to identify the market structure you look for when drawing a correct A, B equals C, D pattern? Hmm. Uh, a, B equals C, D is really sort of like, think of A to D, right? A to D. It's just the problem, the market doesn't really move from A to D. It would like to, don't get me wrong, but the market has to move in this stair-step fashion where it kind of moves like half of the distance from A to B and then B to C, think WD GAN, it has to do a correction to sort of unstretch the rubber band. Think of the rubber band as being stretched from one extreme to the other moving from A to B. And that can be any initial move. And then what you'd like to see is that that initial stretch of the market, technically that's not sustainable because the rubber band has already been stretched out. So the rubber band has to unstretch itself. And so what's the most natural, most healthiest unstretching of the rubber band? That's literally the point from B to C and, you know, if you've been on the site long enough, you know what the bot setup criteria is. This is a great time to do a little quiz of the YouTube audience. What do you think roughly? And if you trade the bot, then you know the answer to this. What would be the natural, healthy anecdote of the rubber band unstretching itself from the A to B B to C, what are the numbers that we're looking for? The market must correct a minimum of this, but no more than that. Anyone? No, this is why people always say that no, I never get any viewers of my audience because I sit and stop everything and wait for you guys to jump through hurdles. See if anybody will even answer. What the hell is he saying? What? Why did he stop talking? <laughs> no answers look at that that's bad <laughs> all right maybe i should wind this up then hey there we go constantine you're awesome great dal moody oh i haven't seen that name in a while interesting you're still around here oh, good to see nore the bodybuilder oh you're so awesome uh, everybody wants me to get nore uh body built especially seeing my body now woo wee has brian ever let his body slide <laughs> No surfing in the surf with Brian this vacation. That's for damn sure. Anyway, um, so the correct answer is, if we want to see a healthy unwinding of the rubber band being stretched from A to B, 
What we want to see is the market correct at least 33%, but no more than 66% of that A to B move. And if that happens, then we know that the rubber band is not stretched out anymore. And we also know, as we said to start off this conversation, that really the market would like to go from A to D. So how do you figure out what D is? Well, if you have the A to B, and then you have the natural unstretching of the rubber band, A to B to C, then you can at that point logically now start coming up with, oh, it turns out the market actually wants to go to D. And how do you figure out what that is? It's really, really simple. It's not rocket science at all. It's just, you know, I think a lot of people kind of overthink this stuff. It's just the way life goes. So, you know, you can make the argument, you know, anywhere along here. You can pick any of these moves. Let's take this move here. There's an A to B, straight line move. Is this ultimately where the market wanted to go? Or did maybe the market actually want to go higher, but the rubber band just got too stretched out? So, you know, we'll change this. Okay, that's regular. And we'll throw on uh, our bot setup. That's why I do these little templates. So remember, I don't want to think. Thinking gets you into trouble, <laughs> which is kind of funny, but it is what it is. So did this move do at least 33%? No more than 66? Well, you can see. Yep, that is correct. So the rubber band has been unstretched. And in fact, they put this M in here. So there probably was a bunch of people that actually went short that really exacerbated the unstretching of this rubber band. So as long as I see 33 to 66, well, then I can start going. All right, well, we got the A to B. In fact, here, let's even do another one. We'll do a line here. Since this was at least 33, but no more than 66, we can say that we now have the uh, B to C. Let's maybe make that blue. So there's the A to B. There's the B to C. And since we know what A to B is, all we got to do is just clone that line, throw it over uh, the C point, and now you have what really should be the ultimate objective of this market, point D. And oh, look at what just happened there. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Like I gotta say, that's pretty cool. This is not a bad explanation of, of how A, B equals C, Ds work. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Is the, is the person who asked that question here? Um, are you here? 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 All right, I'll put this in here. David, actually, looks like, I wonder if this is probably the same gentleman. So uh, we'll throw this on there for you. And then uh, just go and watch that video. And maybe you have to watch it two or three times for it to sink in. And that's fine. If that's the case, so be it. But hopefully you can understand exactly what I just did there. And how you can see that really off of this low and this initial push higher here, you should have been thinking well, you know, they probably want to take the market somewhere up here, and that's where you get your final D. Isn't that cool? I don't know whether that's it. I mean, maybe they have to run up and play with this high, create a bear divergence in there, and then maybe an M comes in, and then back down we go. Well, that could easily be the case. Okay, gang, I think we'll leave it at that. That is 1 o'clock, so actually we, you got a good couple hours out of me here today. Did anybody get any value out of this? I mean, I see we only got like 40 viewers. Well, maybe you could hit the like button. I don't know. Subscribe. Ring Colleen's bell. wonder what Colleen's doing these days. Sure hope she's in good spirits. Ah, nice to see we had a couple other people uh, join the uh, call. Hey, Nick. Hey, TBG. TBG's here representing uh, El Salvador. I swear, if you ever have any questions about whether you want to relocate to El Salvador, TBG's your man. That's for sure. Um... I, as I had said earlier, I think I'm going to take a couple of weeks off now and actually really have forced myself to have a vacation. Um, you're all in uh, Seward and Chris's and Julian's uh, and Grimm's and Shartoshi's and Marat's uh, hands. Um, so uh, try and go easy on them. 
Uh, I know each and every one of them is trying their absolute best uh, to be uh, good uh, uh, stewards for you. And uh, I know that you have taken a huge leap of faith uh, joining and working with TRI. Um, and, um, I, you know, there are so many little facets about this site and our community. I definitely think that uh, joining the community and, and being a part of it, an active member, is uh, super valuable. But at the same time, too, I'm actually really impressed with the community. You know, things like our blog, in a weird sort of way, you know, that blog itself, we should we should really put this behind a paywall. Because, I, you know, I don't see people doing the research that we do uh, at TRI um, for free at all, anywhere. I mean, like this analysis that Josh did on January Barometer here starting this year. I mean, it's just absolute next level. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the, the community is awesome. What I'd really like to see now is I'd actually like to see the community be able to flourish and uh, and and prosper and continue on uh, with a little bit less of the beamish uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But we'll see how it goes. So, all right, slow and steady wins the race. PMA for the win. Uh, don't take no wooden nickels. Remember what your number one job is. Thank you very much, Chris, for your assistance, total boss. Uh, take care of uh, the team uh, while I'm gone. The only thing left to uh, say to you fine people this fine day is uh, bye for now.